Hello. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Cameron Bailey. I'm the CEO of TIFF, and I think I know why you're here. <laughs> so glad to see all of you here for this very special evening in conversation with Taylor Swift. Now, before we begin, we always like to take a moment to reflect on where we are, the land that we're on. And TIFF is located on the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit and the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Wendat, and the Haudenosaunee. And this territory is within the lands that are protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant. And it's home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We're grateful to be working on this land and to support the work of Indigenous filmmakers. Some thanks. Uh, first, thank you to our members, our donors, and supporters for championing TIFF all year round through our mission to uh, transform the way people see the world through film, maybe some of you uh, this evening. Thanks also to our major sponsors, uh, Bell, RBC, Bulgari, and Visa, and of course our lead sponsor, which is Bell, and also our public supporters, the Government of Canada, the Government of Ontario, Telefilm Canada, and the City of Toronto. Now, Taylor Swift is a creative powerhouse, a singer, songwriter, producer, actor, director, this multi-hyphenate artist is the only woman in history to win the Grammy Award for Album of the Year three times. That puts her in the company of artists like Frank Sinatra and Stevie Wonder. In addition to music, Taylor Swift has long been a visual storyteller as well. From influencing the edits of her music videos to writing the treatments for videos herself, then making the jump to director, She's defined a distinct style on screen that draws from her songwriting. You watch her screen work and it's clear that Taylor Swift is a visual storyteller. In 2021, she released re-recordings of Fearless, Taylor's version, and Red, Taylor's version. You know those? As an act of reclamation and creative empowerment. And that last release was followed by All Too Well, the short film which she directed, wrote, produced, and appeared in. It was shot. It was now shot in 35 millimeter, and we're thrilled to present it in 35 millimeter film today for you, for the very first time. Now, while some have made the transition from music to film before, very few have done so to film directing. And just last week at the MTV Video Music Awards, Swift became the first artist ever to win Video of the Year three times. And she also announced details about her forthcoming album, Midnights. <laughs> uh, we have a special guest in addition to Taylor. Please join me in welcoming to the Toronto International Film Festival, Taylor Swift and the star of All Too Well, the short film, Sadie Fink. Hi. I'm Taylor. I just wanted to say, first of all, TIFF is such an incredible, extraordinary festival, and there are so many things that you could be doing with your time. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, I want to say thank you to Cameron and everyone with the Toronto Film Festival because they gave us this time and they gave us this, this moment to show the short film that we're really, really proud of. Um, it's really, really... Oh, thank you. That's... Um, I'm proud of you, too. The, um, it's really meaningful to get to present this short film on 35 millimeter because that was how it was originally shot and we did this print specifically for TIFF. Um, so it's really special that you're here, that we get to be here. But I did want to say, um, you know, before we watch it, I am so, so grateful to Sadie Sink for being here, being in the film. She's the heartbeat of the short film. And the heartbreak of the short film. Um, and I'm just really uh, lucky to get to be here talking to you at all. We're going to do a Q&A afterward. But, you know, I just want to say hi first. We're going to show you the short film now. Thanks. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> uh, 
Thank you. Oh. That's quite a movie. Thanks. That you made. Wow, thank Fantastic. you. Um, so, first time in 35 millimeter in front of an audience, mm -hmm. and there is something that is different about 35. What, what was it like for you? I feel like watching it uh, this time, there was a depth to the, to the color. There's a contrast um, that I haven't seen when I've watched it before mm -hmm. um, in its digitized form when we've um, screened it in theaters or when you watch it online. Like, it's just a different experience, and I was just very grateful to get to share that with you oh, guys. That's great. Thank you. So we, um, we want to go back. We're going to come back to All Too Well, but I want to begin with you uh, as a songwriter, because one of the things you're best known for uh, are your lyrics, your, your songwriting. And your lyrics are memorized, right? Uh, they are studied by scholars. Oh my uh, god. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, and I wonder, in your initial development as a songwriter coming up, um, how much of the process for you was visual? It was always um, part of the process, because when I would write a song, I would immediately start thinking of, how do I want to present this on stage? If I made a music video for this, what would it look like? Um, and then when I would create an album, you know, partially through or halfway through, I would start conceptualizing, what does this album look like? What are the colors we're dealing with here? What are the themes? What are the aesthetics? Like, what do I want this to symbolize? Because I, from a very early point in my career, wanted to establish each album as its own era of sorts. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and I think that it's, it's really something um, that I can only thank the fans for, that you, know, you can't really do things like that if people don't care and pay attention to it. So um, it was always a part of the process, mm -hmm. establishing the visuals. And early on, when we would make music videos, the process was, you know, I'm 16. I'd reach out to a video director, and I'd say, hey, I think it would be cool if the concept was that we were like, you know, I'm in love with my best friend in high school, and he lives across the street. And like, there, but there's this cheerleader who he's dating, and then, <laughs> then there's a football game that ends with a dance, and there's these signs. Like, we, you know, you'd come up with concepts. Okay. And over time, I started to take on more and more responsibility. And the more responsibility I took on creatively, the happier I was. Right. So here we are. And here you are as a director. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and what has your path through movies been? What films did you love growing up? And what, what images from movies still stay with you as a, as a musician? Uh, I think that it has fluctuated over time. I've always really loved um, certain films during certain phases I was in musically. Like, I, was, I made an album called 1989. And I... Thank you for listening to it. I appreciate it. Um, and I, I, I would watch John Hughes movies. I'd just watch Sixteen Candles oh, and yeah. Breakfast Club all the time, just over and over. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, and then, you know, this would, this would happen throughout my career for different things, but I remember the pandemic hit, and I, I was watching a lot of... I remember watching two back-to-back -back Guillermo del Toro movies, okay. Devil's Backbone and then Pan's Labyrinth. Nice. And so good one. my yeah, whole good. world turned into folk tales and, yes. and forests and mythical creatures. And I was just so dazzled by those films. And I'd always, obviously, like Shape of Water is one of my favorite films ever. But I hadn't seen those two very pinnacle films in mm. his, in his uh, repertoire. And then I watched Rear Window, oh. which I hadn't seen, which is embarrassing, but, mm -hmm. but I hadn't seen it at that point, and, and it was very voyeuristic. It was mm -hmm. very much like, you know, he's watching his neighbors, and like, he sees a murder. I haven't experienced that, but <laughs> I did, I did, um, I did experience combining some of those cinematic inspirations mm -hmm. and films that I loved with like, okay, so you end up with an album that is me telling stories from other people's perspectives right. in a very folk tale okay. kind right. of... Um, a mix of Rear Window and Del Toro's movies in a way. You know, if I yeah. had to assign uh, yeah. you know, the culprits cinematically, yeah. uh -huh. I would say it would be those three films. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> oh, and then, okay. then my next, the next record I like, I was just nonstop watching Sense and Sensibility, the Ang Lee oh, yes. one, the Kate Winslet, just wow. everything. Yeah. Um, and that was for an album called Evermore. It's just, I have very specific. Mm -hmm. 
film memories mm -hmm. for things. But with this one, um, I think my obsession with there is this, I don't know if it's actually something people talk about, but in my mind, there's this period of time in the 70s where you started seeing these romantic films where they, these two characters are so beautifully, intimately woven together, mm -hmm. and, then, and then they just unravel the braid right in front of you, right. and you just can't believe it, like the way we were, mm -hmm. and love story. Yes. Kramer versus Kramer. Yeah, I was just going to mention that one. Yeah, yeah it's Meryl just is amazing in that film. Yeah, and so those ones were ones that I think because I love those films, just hitting those emotional touchstones that those films just punch me in the stomach and mm -hmm. hit. Um, and then I think mo in in terms of modern films that I loved, that probably lended themselves to making this film, I would say, Marriage Story really right. upsetting for mm -hmm. months. I was not, all right. <laughs> and um, and the souvenir part one and two. Oh yes, Joanna Hogg's Joanna films. Joanna Hogg's yeah. films, I just absolutely love that she, I had actually made the short film by the time I went and saw the souvenir part two. And the fact that it's about this young woman who experiences this extreme heartbreak yes. and despair and then makes something. Mm -hmm. I was just like, oh, that's exactly, <laughs> speaking to you. It's exactly what I want to <laughs> see in a film. <laughs> so, hmm. you mentioned the 70s. I heard that you also like John Cassavetti's uh, yes, films. Yes, in the yes, 70s. yes. Uh, also big heartbreak, big emotion. Yeah, and I, I just think um, being, I don't know, I just really love how he allows despair and human emotion to just play out. Yeah. It just is allowed to breathe and play itself out. Mm -hmm. um, you see the loose ends. Yes. Right? It's not tied up. You feel like you're really in that house with yeah. that fight going on, and, mm -hmm. and it's just harrowing. <laughs> yes. Well, the fight that you crafted here also feels that way, and I love how the music stops, and you really begin to see their relationship kind of disintegrate Yeah. and then come back together a little bit, but... Um, it, it, it feels like it draws on some of that same kind of spirit from those 70s movies. Such a nice thing for you to say to me. Um, <laughs> I think you can tell a lot about people based on how they fight or argue. Mm -hmm. um, and I think with this film, I went into it um, having scripted out a few different scenes and knowing that I wanted to show one of them in depth um, and at length. And when it came time to shoot you know, we filmed them breaking up. Um, we filmed them falling in love, some of the dialogue with that. But I kind of, as we got closer to it, I was like, it's going to be the fight. It's mm -hmm. going to, I just, I think that we, we had scripted it out, but I had talked to Dylan and Sadie so much about what their intentions were and mm -hmm. who, and what exactly it is that's the catalyst for this fight and why it's not about him just dropping her hand. It's about this entire um, just molecular structure where she feels out of place and he feels unequipped to handle that and it mm -hmm. all comes back to being in different places in their lives having this huge gap of age difference between them mm -hmm. she's still got one foot in girlhood one foot in this very adult world his life is very cultivated it just I just felt like we had talked so much about it that I was dealing with such emotionally intelligent actors. Mm -hmm. And we talked so much about this that when we actually um, shot, it ended up being, like, I think probably 92% of that scene is a one -er. Really? Yeah, we don't cut till the very end oh, until he yes. says, why, yeah. don't look at me like that. Yeah. That's the yeah. first time we cut. Wow. And we were just, uh, m my producer Saul and I were just at the monitors, just like there was like a death clutch <laughs> as we're watching this because we're like, oh my God, oh my God. Like we're injuring each other's arms mm -hmm. at this point. Like, but also try not to make a sound because we just, we're just so in awe of how much we could trust these actors mm -hmm. with every single bit of the scene, the story, yeah. the weight. Well, so much is in the writing, I think, as well, your writing, because Aww. you really, <laughs> I'm serious. Hey. Um, you know, for me, when I was watching, I've seen this sh uh, short film many times now, and, um, what I really got from it is that she does not feel seen. 
yes. in that relationship. And she's trying to tell him about an instance where she did not feel seen mm -hmm. in, in the company of his friends, and he's not really getting it. Yeah. You know? And that's such a powerful moment because they're so intimate and yet so far apart. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a really amazing takeaway because... Um, I, I've always been very fascinated, and one of the reasons I wanted to make a short film and not a music video for this song is because I've been fascinated with the dynamic of the age of the character that Sadie's playing, and what a precarious age that is when you are, you, you could fit back at your family home, sort of, but you sort of don't. You could fit in an adult's cultivated apartment where they have like a French press and they have <laughs> all the things that adults have, but you kind of don't. Mm. So you kind of fit everywhere, but you kind of fit nowhere. And I think that plays into a little bit of where she's coming from. Mm. Um, and I have to credit Dylan too with the fact that I know that he's gaslighting her and I know that he's mm. like, he's like, I know it's problematic, but I'm watching that. And I'm like, he is so charismatic. He is charismatic, problematic, and I am still sort of rooting for them to work through this right. because he makes some charming points yeah. and he does it in a really, really like, I don't know, just the way that they both played it. I was just blown away. It's, it's beautiful because I'm sure so many people relate to it as well because charismatic, problematic, Definition of a boyfriend, maybe? An ex-boyfriend. <laughs> okay, an ex-boyfriend. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <you, laughs> I don't know how far we want to go with that, but... Um, zero. You, zero, that's Nowhere. it. Nowhere. Uh, you mentioned music videos, and I do want to go back. So, because before you directed this film, you began to have increasing... Um, visual input into uh, the, the making of your music videos. And I want to ask about that process, um, how you were drawn to, the, to cr getting into the creativity of the music videos as opposed to just being on camera. The collaborators, you've worked with a couple of directors quite a lot. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious to, uh, to know what that process was like for you to get more and more uh, creative input and control ultimately into your videos. Yeah, it was it was a baby step baby yeah. steps process. It wasn't it wasn't like I woke up one day and I was like, you know what I want to do? Direct. <laughs> like it just ne that was never something that I was programmed to say to myself because I didn't go to film school. Um, I I've been on the set of sixty plus music videos and I've learned a lot from that process because I've always got my eyes and ears open and I'm always looking at shots and thinking I like that one I don't like that why why and why not I like that lighting I don't like that light why and why not uh, you know and so you kind of are learning uh, based on your experience but I had a really really close creative relationship with Joseph Kahn who's mm -hmm. an just like a legend in music videos he he did Toxic by Britney Spears, which mm -hmm. is like, just to like give you an example of what we're dealing with. <laughs> and um, we made several music videos and we got to the point where I'd call him up and I'd be like, okay, wrote this song called Look What You Made Me Do. I want to come out of the ground as a zombie, right? <laughs> we're seeing my hand out of the ground and then I'm dead. And then, and then I, and then like, and I'm in a bathtub of diamonds and then there's a mountain of me's trying to kill the current me. And he'd be on the phone and be like, yeah, I know exactly what we're doing. Okay, amazing, amazing. Um, and so like, that having that relationship where like essentially it got to the point where I was sort of starting to write the treatments mm -hmm to the videos, and um, I then decided it might be really cool to, to co-direct and to step into that role, and so, um, you know, I, I got to co-direct co a few videos with incredible collaborators, and I learned what it was like to start, you know, writing in-depth treatments and shot listing mm -hmm. and really um, leaning into it, but when I did it on my own, that was when I really, mm -hmm. um, really learned everything yeah. um, because you have to, I guess. You have to. And, yeah. it's, and it, was, it was so surprising to me because um, I didn't really want to turn back after that. Hmm. I just had so much fun. The first video I directed on my own was a video called The Man. And it's it's weird video. because it. I'm prosthetically turned into a dude for the whole video. So this was the first video I ever directed on my own. So if you can imagine me trying to direct child actors <laughs> while I'm 
dress prosthetically as a man. I've got like prosthetic, like rubber, whatever they put on you on my face, and I'm trying to like talk to little kids about what their mm -hmm. action is, and they know something's not quite right, and so, and their mom told them that this is Taylor Swift, but they, but they don't really understand <laughs> how that could be possible. Yes, it you was, have a beard, and you 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 have a I body have suit a on. It's, it was honestly like it was incredible. The yeah. experience was so wild and wonderful, and I got to work with the incredible Rodrigo Prieto as my mm -hmm. DP, which I can't still can't believe that that happened to me, um, because he's just so it's incredible. incredible. Yeah. yeah, and so that happened, and then the pandemic mm. happened, uh, and I ended up directing in the middle of the, you know, the sourdough early phase of the, of the <laughs> pandemic, um, this, this video uh, called Cardigan. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> thanks. And then I did another one uh, for a song called Willow. And that was when I thought, you know, I feel like, I feel like I could do more. I feel like I could, I, I feel like I'm ready for more. And yeah. so that was when um, I decided to make the short film mm. for All Too Well. Mm. Um, you also draw from movies uh, for some of the imagery in your uh, in your films, and there's these great references. The man reminded me at the beginning, anyhow, of Wolf of, Wolf of Wall Street. Thank you. There's Honestly, such a vibe there from deeply that. on purpose. Yeah, okay. I love I love <laughs> that about. film. Yeah, I absolutely adore that film so much. Um, so it's mm -hmm. kind of like an like an homage, you yeah, know. Sure. The people when you reference things, like people don't know if you're trolling or if you're like, I love that film. I absolutely <laughs> love that film. And I then really the Bad do. Blood video is all like futuristic action movie. Like yeah, it universe was, it's, there. you know, the espionage. That's yeah. a phone call with me and Joseph Kahn mm -hmm. where I'm like, I, what if Selena kicks me out a window <laughs> and, and, and tries to kill me, but I don't die. And then I go to spy school yeah. and they all teach me how to fight. Mm -hmm. It's, and he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's explosions and, you know. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was a blast. And that was kind of like tipping our hat to, the kind of spy thriller sure. genre. Genre, mm -hmm. yes. Um, <laughs> all right, so I want to ask you uh, more about going from the videos that you directed to this one, the, the, the short film, because it, it feels like just in terms of your creative evolution, there's more ambition here, you're doing more with it, shooting on 35, longer format, there's a whole dramatic, intense scene there, which could have come out of marriage story, <laughs> almost, oh, you know? Oh. Um, <laughs> I need some water. <laughs> no, but it has that so kind cool of, of you to say that. emotional intensity. It's raw, like uh, like that Noah Baumbach film is. Um, so I want to ask about uh, just putting that film together, particularly uh, the technical side of it. Shoot, deciding to shoot on thirty-five millimeter, deciding on the one point three three uh, aspect ratio, that kind of old vibe and the richness of those colors and the shallow focus. All of those things are decisions yes. that you made, and I want to know what those decisions were toward. What was the impact you wanted from all of those things? Well, all the decisions that you make, it's such a beautifully collaborative process. You make decisions, you know, based on your your idea as to how you want it to feel, how you want it to look, and then you bring on people you trust. Like I trust Rena Yang, our DP, implicitly. I, I absolutely was so lucky to get to work with her um, and brought her on early on and showed her my endless mood boards and my references and, and, and what I was looking for in terms of lighting and color and, and texture. And it was, it was pretty apparent that we both wanted to shoot on 35 millimeter. Mm -hmm. um, I did not know how to do that. Sure, <laughs> I, yes. I've never done it before. People so. mostly don't do that anymore. Yeah, yeah, and so she's, she's excellent at it. And so, you know, she was the one who was like, I think we should shoot you know, interiors on Vision 3, 500T stock. I think we should shoot the exteriors on Ektachrome because I love the way that, the, you know, the greens are going to pop. Mm -hmm. uh, you that know was, your film stocks, Taylor. She taught me a lot. <laughs> okay. She I'm really, impressed. really, really taught me a lot, and I never would have known any mm -hmm. anything at all um, mm -hmm. without her. So, um, you know, it was also kind of talking about making intentional, purposeful decisions about lighting, warm tones versus cool tones, and how we want her apartment to feel um, versus his world to feel. And we wanted them to feel very different. And we figured since we're dealing with a short film, we don't have a lot of time to say much about their identity. So we wanted to make technical, um, subtle decisions in terms of lighting and, and set design. We worked with the incredible Ethan Tobin, 
Um, and one of um, my favorite references of set design is in The Way We Were. Um, Barbara Streisand plays this character called Katie and her apartment, when you look at her apartment, that's who she is. It's, it's her interests, it's her politics, it's, her, it's the books she mm. reads, it's who she is. Yeah. And I wanted, um, Sadie plays a character named Her, I wanted her apartment <laughs> to, to be her. I wanted mm. it to look like who she is. And I, I wanted the same for his space, um, you know, clean and cool and mm -hmm. minimalist and mature and sophisticated and elegant and sexy mm -hmm. um, and dark. <laughs> so You see that. And sometimes audiences pick that up consciously, but sometimes they're just kind of absorbing it. They don't even know that they're actually understanding more about the character by watching their environment. That's the dream. Yeah. That's the goal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, uh, I want to ask you about casting Dylan O'Brien and, and Sadie Sink, and, and not just each individual actor, but the two of them together. That's important, too. Yes. I don't know if it was a decision. It was what my heart needed for this film. It was, like, mm -hmm. it was, like a, it was a very instinctual decision based on having watched their performances. Um, and if I had to assign analytical thought to it, I would say I had never seen either one of them uh, play roles like this before. And I'd seen them just ace anything that was put in front of them. And I just thought, I wonder, I wonder if Sadie Sink wants to play a romantic lead. Mm -hmm. um, I know I haven't seen it yet. I think she's at that perfect point in her career where she could, I mean, like, I think she could absolutely, um, as the kids would say, eat this up. <laughs> um, yes. You know, and... Um, <laughs> Basically, with Dylan, um, it was that charisma that I'd seen him. I'd seen his films, and I'd seen him. I mean, even just him doing an interview, you can see that he's got this, this just like, you know, mm -hmm. this dangerous charm. Like, uh -huh. him as a person, he's not a dangerous, <laughs> but he's dangerously charming, and that right. he's just like, that is a power that he has. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was looking, I, I also just, when I write, I really gravitate towards you know, looking up to writer-directors because that's the way that I can make sense of, um, of, of writing and then, then knowing what shots I want and directing mm -hmm. um, if I've written it. And then when I was writing it, I just was writing Sadie. Like, I wasn't writing, thinking of any other actress or thinking of a, you know, a generic, you know, beautiful, wide-eyed young person. I was, I was writing it for Sadie, and if she would have said no, I just don't know if I would have made the mm -hmm. film, mm -hmm. honestly. Really? Yeah, it's true. It's the, it's, <laughs> it's true. Um, so, and I also just really, really wanted them both to say yes, because I didn't, I know we have to compromise in life, but I didn't have a backup plan, and I didn't want to <laughs> compromise. And I was just so happy that they, that they trusted me and that they believed in me, and I'd, I'd never, I was a first time short film director, and I just, I couldn't believe that they wanted to do it. I'm still, I still can't believe that anybody wanted to do this with me. I'm so happy about it. <laughs> uh, well, you, you delivered, right? Thank you so for saying that. That's all you need. Um, did, you, did you screen test them together or rehearse with them no, together? Like, no, no, no. I texted, I texted Dylan the longest text uh -huh. you've ever, ever seen. Like, it was, it, it was, when I read it back, I was like, that was too much. <laughs> and straight up, like, reached out to Sadie's team, and we were just like, we want to we make something. You know, I think I did a, I think, did, was it a text or a call? It was a text for some long, long text and then a call. <laughs> it was, yeah, I was just like, please, 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 please. please. Like, I wasn't trying to be cool at all. <laughs> no chill. I, I was like, I... <laughs> I promise, I promise, no one will work harder to make this good than me. Like, I don't know. I don't know if I went that far, but I was just, I mean, they were, in, I, they, they were amazing. They didn't, need, they didn't need to be convinced in a way that I was able to pick up on. Mm -hmm. So I was so happy. Because you want to make people, you want to make things with people who are excited to make things with you. I don't really do that well with people who are like, I'm not sure about you, prove it. Right. Like, I'm okay, I will, but that's not as fun. <laughs> like, if I have to do it, I will prove it. But it would be so much better if you just really wanted to make stuff with us. Yeah. And so that's what we were lucky enough to have. Mm -hmm. um, 
All of the, the evolution we've been talking about from beginning to contribute to and collaborate on music videos to making your own short films and this one, um, it, particularly recently, it's coincided with you taking back control of your music. Yeah. Which we've all been following and celebrating. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. I, I really appreciate you saying that. Um, but if you're new to this saga, um, <laughs> <laughs> what Cameron's referencing is that basically, um, I started out on an indie record label I signed when I was a teenager, and I had always had the hope, desire, and dream of um, buying back my master recordings for my first six albums when it came time to, when my record deal was fulfilled. Um, when my deal was done, that didn't happen. My music was all sold to an outside party. And I, so it's, it's, a, it's we don't, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, but basically, what, what happened was like a period of like extreme despair for me. And then I came out of that and said to myself, if I made that music the first time, I can make it a second time. And, and it was so um, exciting, honestly, to get to do something that I haven't really seen done in the music industry in this particular way. Stroke genius. That is so nice. That is no, so really. nice. This is brilliant. Yeah. Um, There's an only. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so basically, we, we treat them like they're big releases. Like we, we do a whole album. We, do, we redo the entire photo shoot. Mm -hmm. You know, we make, we make music videos and sometimes we make a short film. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's really been honestly insanely beautiful because you have, um, like, you know, my friend's daughter is like, 12 and her friends were saying like oh like we just um we love this new taylor swift song that just came out called you belong with me and i was like <laughs> like You're who's gonna tell her it. no like don't yeah. tell her that's that's a really old song that yeah. came out in like what like 2008 or something mm -hmm. um so it's really been an amazing opportunity to revisit my old music make exact copies of the old music. And what I also do now is I like, there were a lot of songs that I wrote that didn't end up on the album. So we call those songs from the vault tracks. So I record them, I put them out. So it's, it's been really wonderful and it's only been possible because the fans actually want this to happen. I, can, I, st I can't believe that too, like that's amazing that you guys have been so wonderful about it. But basically this song, All Too Well, the 10 minute version has a very long story. <laughs> it is a story about as long as the song, but I'll try to make it shorter. It, this was um, a song that originally was released on an album called Red in 2012. Thank you so much. You guys are great. Um, and it was a song that I loved so much, but it was never chosen by you know, an A&R team in a conference room as being a single. Nobody, nobody saw the potential in it except for the fans who loved it so much that they made it sort of their favorite song on that album. For me, the song was so um, tough because it was about something that at that point was very current for me. I, I would have like a really hard time performing it at the time. Like I had to really like force myself to focus on other things to try to get through it during tour. So there would, there would be no world in which I could have made a visual element to that song at that point in time. I needed 10 years mm. of sort of retrospect in mm -hmm. order to know what I would even make right. to, to um, tell a version of that story visually. Mm -hmm. And I'm so grateful that I was able to do that with some crazy stroke of all these different twists of fate. Can't mm -hmm. believe it. Do you make a connection between um, coming to the point where you can create your own images and owning your own music? What's the connection? I think it's I think it's very connected, and not in a way that was in, not in a way that was conscious, but I think in a way where you know, hopefully, the more years you live, the more things you learn, and you hope that you get braver mm -hmm. as time goes on. And I've been very lucky to. Um, you know, when I've taken these baby steps creatively, I've had I've been very lucky to have people go like, no, 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 go further. It's great. We like keep going. You know, it's, um, and I think I would have really tried to keep expanding creatively, even if I had been like squashed um, the first time I tried to make something. But it was 
really beautiful that we're in a place where um, hearing the idea of a female filmmaker doesn't make you roll your eyes or think as skeptically as it once was. And we have, you know, so many incredible female filmmakers to thank for that. Yes. Like, you know? A lot of them here during the festival. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and I just feel really grateful. Like, you think about people like Nora Ephron, who, yes. you know, there's people who paved the path, and then there's, like, Nora Ephron, like, in the forest with a machete, just, like, hacking, <laughs> like, to where the path will be paved. Mm -hmm. And I think about writer-directors like that who inspired the, the writer-directors who inspired me. It's like a whole, I think about people like that all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I want to go to um, actually a, a question we have from somebody on Twitter. We've got a few questions from cool. social media. Love. It, because it's related. Uh, this is uh, at Long Story Swift uh, on Twitter. Excellent. And they ask, right? Pretty Solid. good handle. Yeah. Uh, I loved your shout out to female directors at the VMAs. Are there any female directors in particular that inspired your vision for this film? Oh, definitely. Um, like I said, Nora Ephron mm -hmm. as a writer director. Okay, yeah. um, I love Chloe Zhao. Mm. I love Greta Gerwig. Um, I love Lena Dunham. There are so many people that I absolutely adore who are making films in such like brave, bold, inspiring ways, mm -hmm. and um, and they're women that I just look up to and admire, and have sometimes been like lucky enough to be in a room with. Or Lena is always there for me if I have a question and. Right. Just such a good friend. And she's got a new film here at the yes, festival as well. Yes, she does. Right? Yeah. I've seen it. It's so good. Catherine called Birdie. You're going to love it. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> and a nice departure for her as well. It's yes. It's set way, way in the past, and it's also hilarious. It's one of my so. favorite things she's ever done. Yes. So go um, see it. Another question. <laughs> um, also from Twitter from at Wildflower Hoax. Uh, and they're asking, tell us about the lighting in All Too Well, the short film. What was the significance in the contrast between warm and cold? Talked a little bit about that It's before. really good to be asked this question. And this person says, I've seen dozens of theories, but would love to hear the intent behind it. So I really wanted this. I had a few overarching goals with, um, with, this, with the lighting and you know, just sort of um, the coloring and everything. I really wanted this short film to feel like autumn. Um, and not the entire time you're watching it, but in your memory. Mm. I referenced the film Love Story from like yeah. 1970 earlier. Mm -hmm. And um, when I think of that film, I think of Autumn. I just do. Right. Um, and so I was, I was trying to, I think, establish that in the earlier parts of, um, of the short film. And like when they're falling in love, I wanted that to feel warmer. And when we're in... Um, his world, his apartment, I wanted it to feel cooler. Uh, and then when Sadie goes into her um, periods of despair and reeling, I wanted her world to become cooler. And then in the end, when we see her grown up, I wanted it to be a bit of a combination of both, almost to symbolize that she is still herself, but she has been changed by this experience. Um, and I wanted uh, that to make us both happy and sad at the same time. Mm. Um, but I think that it's, it's also important when you think about um, the worlds that you're creating. Like, we were working within the framework of chapters. Um, we had this amazing typography studio called Fraser Muggridge do these bespoke chapter title cards. And those were there because um, I wanted you to realize in the end that Sadie had been, that these are chapters of, of um, Sadie's character's book. So when you see cap, uh, ch the, the chapters like, mm -hmm. are you real? And the first crack in the glass, right. you, want, you realize in the end that that. This is the story she's telling about her Yes, past. this is her re reflecting back. And these are chapters of her book. Mm -hmm. And these are the things that you're seeing taking place that you would read about in the book that she was writing. So mm -hmm. we wanted there to be sort of like a, we wanted her to, to seem a little bit changed in the end, even with the set design. Her, her, the house where she lives in the end looks a little bit more like where he lived. Okay. than where right. she was before. So she has actually taken something from that relationship. Yeah, good and bad. Yeah, interesting. Um, there's another element in the film that there are a lot of theories about, which is that red scarf. Yeah. <laughs> what can you... <laughs> um, 
what can you tell us about the red scarf? Because it must uh, have been a lot of decisions that went into exactly what. Can, what what yeah. can I tell you <laughs> is the question. Um, basically, you stop it. <laughs> stop it. Um, basically, the scarf is a metaphor, um, and we turned it red because, uh, because red is a very important um, color in this album, which is called Red. Right. <laughs> um, and I think when I say it's a metaphor, I'm just going to stop. Leave it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to say thanks for the incredible question to whoever <laughs> asked it. You've really taken us for a ride with uh, that one. Thank you. Scarf question was mine, actually. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, at Cameron Bailey. That's right. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> All right, but I, I am going to go back to, uh, this time, TikTok. Yes. Zara on TikTok is asking, are there any other genres within filmmaking that you'd be eager to pursue? Ooh. Uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a good suggestion. Um, I think I will always want to tell human stories about human emotion. I never say never, but I can't imagine myself like filming an action sequence. Mm. It's just for me, like, I, if it happens one day, honestly, like, that'll be funny character growth. But <laughs> um, at this point, I want to, you know, I could see it going, I could see the, it going in a more comedic, irreverent place. Mm. Mm. I could see it being a little bit, you know, I, I don't always see myself telling stories about extreme guttural heartbreak mm -hmm. at your most formative age that <laughs> that really sort of you know debilitates you emotionally for sure. years and then mm -hmm. you have to like develop the scar tissue in order to move on with your life <laughs> um and then like you know limp your way to your typewriter <laughs> and write a novel about it because uh you're still you know yeah you can't keep doing that I no hope. it's gonna be painful after i think i've done that yeah okay. <laughs> so i would love i would love to um I mean, I'd love to keep taking baby steps forward. And mm -hmm. I think that I'm at a place now where like the next baby step is like not a baby step. It would be committing to making a film. And I, I feel like I would just absolutely love for the right opportunity to arise because I just I absolutely, absolutely adore telling stories this mm -hmm. way. Well, that's where I was going as well. Feature film's got to be next, no? If it were the right thing, yeah. um, it, would, it would be such a privilege and an honor. And I, I also just do want to say that I'm aware of the fact that I'm in, in an incredibly privileged place to have gotten to finance this short film independently. Because when we talk about female filmmakers, um, I am one of them, but I also realize that there are people who are working so hard to get financing and to, to get any type of budget together to make the productions that they, and the projects that they want to make. So I, I, I honestly like bow down and tip my hat to those female filmmakers. We, uh, we have an initiative here at TIFF called uh, Share Her Journey, which is all about supporting uh, female filmmakers. We've been doing it for five years now. And um, it's just, you know, there are doors that need to be opened or kicked down in order for women to have more opportunities that they don't, usually don't. There are incredible stats about women graduating film school at the same rate as men, but then, you know, 10 years into their careers, very different. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So um, things still need to change, but uh, it's great that you're aware of that and, you know, the need for change. It's great that you're taking those initiatives. That's amazing. We're trying to do our bit. It's incredible. Yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I should have like a URL for you all to go to, but I don't right now. Um, you They're know. very resourceful. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure you are. You will find it. Uh, you still have your music career, of course, right? We're talking about your film work, but how like, are you going to balance it? Last time I checked, like, I, <laughs> I, yeah, I love that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I do have my music career. And are you, I mean, is, like, how much of the visual side of it, whether it's more films, music videos, that kind of thing, how much do you think that will take up of your time and creativity? Uh, you know, it's, it's an interesting projection to try to come up with having not thought about that exact thing ever before. Mm. Um, I, I really, uh, I have a lot of bandwidth to put into creative things. Mm -hmm. And um, I never, I get exhausted by things in life, but they're never creative things. Mm -hmm. um, mm. 
I love making stuff. And I'm okay. like, for the last like five or six years, I've just been like, I just love making stuff. I just want to never do anything but make stuff. <laughs> oh. So I just hope that that keeps going. I am so lucky to be supported by kind, generous, nice, thoughtful people who seem to care about stuff I make. It's, I just hope that that keeps going. I'm gonna keep working hard, trying my best, mm -hmm. all of that. <laughs> and I, yeah, and yeah I, I would absolutely love to expand in terms of filmmaking and storytelling and, and keep, you know, it's a natural extension of my mm -hmm. writing. I really feel that and as long as I can keep doing all the natural extensions of my writing. You know, mm -hmm. you know, doing shows is a natural extension of my writing. I love mm -hmm. that too. Yeah. Uh, I wanna do I wanna do all the things. Mm -hmm. Well Taylor, we're out of time, but I just wanna thank you so mm -hmm. much for this uh, conversation. I get, oh I'm hearing that we have a little bit more time. Thank you. <laughs> if you're willing we'll keep it going for just a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I would love it. Um, because um, I wanted to ask you, you, you talked about um, Sadie and Dylan as the actors that you absolutely wanted for mm -hmm. All Too Well, the short film. And in future film projects or just ideas that might be percolating, I wonder if there's certain actors that you have in mind. Totally. I definitely do. But if I, if I say, you know, if I say that, then mm -hmm. if I go to them and say, they'll already know. Do you know what I mean? And then I won't <laughs> yes. have an opportunity to write them like a, long a novel <laughs> length text, which honestly, there's just something in that, you yeah. know? Mm -hmm. Me just begging people to work with me over text message or voice memo or whatever it is that I did. <laughs> um, no, I, I absolutely, I, I, there are so many actors out there that when I watch a film, I think that sparks, that sparks a character that, you know, or they seem like actors that you could trust with, um, with filling them in on the scene, writing it, but also saying, okay, now do a take where you, I wanna see what you would do mm -hmm. if, you had, if you could forget parts of the script and just do this as the character. That's what I had with Dylan and Sadie. Yeah. It was really, you know, we safeguarded it so that there, there was a script, mm -hmm. but I'm gonna be honest with you, when you compliment the writing in that scene, a lot of that is them. Mm -hmm. So, because they're just brilliant and right. they're so natural, um, and their chemistry was so electric that um, I, I couldn't, I, I could not possibly take credit for all the things that they said and the ways that they said them. It was mm -hmm. just like phenomenal to watch it happen. Mm -hmm. So, those moments are the things that, as a storyteller, you're just sitting there thinking, it is, it is the most brilliant thing when that many people can come together to collaborate because when I'm making music it's usually you know either me writing on my own or I'm in a studio with one other person and it's a very that's 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 two people and that, and that feels collaborative and fun but when you're on a on a film set mm -hmm. sometimes you just catch yourself looking over at the camera operator or the first AD or or someone hanging a light in the perfect exact spot and you're just thinking I cannot believe how talented and so specialized and brilliant these people are, and we're all working together to make to make this. And when you have it culminate in a scene, like what Sadie and Dylan did over and over again during this short film, it just feels very, it feels like a big group hug. I can't watch it without when Sadie, um, I know it's become a meme, but it, <laughs> but when I watch um, Sadie see him call her and she's mm -hmm. laying in bed and she's, and she's crying so hard that she actually physically grabs her chest. It's, it just really messes me up. Mm -hmm. Like it actually physically hurts me mm -hmm. when I see that. Wow. Cause, really? cause she, yeah, it does, cause she's so talented and, mm -hmm. and she really makes me believe that she's going through that. And I, their, their chemistry in this was so good that I actually, by the end of watching it, I just wish that they, I wish he would, I wish he would kind of maybe like go in the bookstore. Mm. But but it is I did I did want to end it in terms of you know, I think it's really um just devastating when a character goes from being in in another character's life to then being a voyeur watching yeah. from the outside from in inside. like you were a, you were a main character right. and now now you're standing outside a window. Yeah. There's that barrier is just so brutal. Mm. Anyway, um, <laughs> we come back to brutal one way or the other. Yeah. Right? Um, there's 
something um, in, in what you said in terms of uh, the scene where, where Sadie's clutching her chest, which sounds like that wasn't direction. That was something that she came to, or was it a combination? How did you come that? To was that? something we, that one we were going for. Oh, you we, were, okay. Well, I didn't say clutch your chest, uh -huh. um, <laughs> but but there there were these moments where we knew we were, um, we were filming a certain phase of her grieving. Mm -hmm. And we knew some of it was you know, different phases of her letting go of this person. And this was one of the ones that Sadie and I knew from the jump that this one was going to be, you know, the kind of crying that like racks your body, mm -hmm. like just the kind of crying where you can't breathe. And she got herself there in a way that was so um, unbelievably impressive. Um, and I mean, her her face was completely red, and her body, and it was it was in her body that crying. It, and I just, when I saw her preparing, you know, you you want to ask an actor what way in which they want to prepare for that, and like, she got herself there um, to a place that I think really, really makes people when they watch it, they know that she's she's emotionally, physically mentally hurt every, there's there's every aspect of pain mm -hmm. coursing through this person mm -hmm. and for her to to give us that performance is genu genuinely just such a generous thing to do as as a performer absolutely yeah so <laughs> um, some directors do direct in a very detailed physical way you know move your elbow here to an inch more this way that kind of way and Actors might not like that, but some directors want that kind of precision, and other directors do, I think, more like what you're describing. And I wonder how you find that balance in terms of you have this vision in your head. You know what you're going for in terms of the effect. Mm -hmm. But how, how much do you direct the detail of your actors' performances? Uh, with this one, it was really about um, naturalism. Okay. So we're not trying to get a, a perfectly symmetrical shot, and if you are two inches to this way, you mess up the shot because mm. the shot's all about symmetry of the right. desk and the lantern and the lantern. You know, it's right. not... It's not Wes Anderson. Oh, I love Wes <laughs> but Anderson. But we love Wes Anderson, but this is <laughs> but what I, That's exactly what I'm referencing because <laughs> yes. I love Wes Anderson. <laughs> yeah. um, but, you know, there is a... Di when I watch a Chloe Zhao film, that, mm. is, that is her with a steady cam finding the emotion in the shot, and I find that just as riveting mm -hmm. as when I'm watching a Wes Anderson film. And, um, and, I, and I love both types of film. But with this, we were really going for more of that, just the, the heart throbbing naturalism because um, their physicality and them being natural within those moments, you know, I'd be in the car with them and when I'm in the back seat of that, of that like 90s Mercedes that we had, like me and Rena are in the back seat of the car and there is a moment where we're like, okay, you know, Dylan put her hair behind her ear. Sadie, look over at him and grin. Tell a joke. You know, they were, they're kind of just talking to each other off the cuff, but you would, you would reach in verbally and just give them a bit of a prompt. Right. Um, and that happened definitely more in the times where they're, you know, they're falling in love and there's this chemistry. Um, it, it was a really great combination of feeling like, oh my God, they've got this. Like there were moments where you're like, just let them go. Do not mess with that. Don't mess with, with what they're doing. And then there would be moments where you're like, okay, you know, I can't see. There's a big, massive tear about to roll down her face, but there's one piece of hair blocking it. So uh -huh. you're just like, Sadie, move your hair. And then just, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah. like, but you also don't want to mess with that too much. I don't know. I mean, it's really just a case-by-case -case situation. Right. <laughs> sure, I get it, as it is probably for most directors. Uh, yeah. One other piece in terms of uh, performance, uh, which many people don't see when they're watching films, but it's editing. Yes. You can create a performance in the edit suite yes. sometimes, in terms of the time you take with yes. each scene. Our, t our editor, Ted Gard, is absolutely incredible. And Saul and I would sit in, in the edit suite every single day, going through every single thing we had shot. And, um, and the edit, I think, you know, it being, um, part of it being set to music helped because I knew exactly, uh, there were some shots that were really locked in, right? Like there's a scene where we have, you know, a tracking shot and the dolly's right. moving in and it's her, um, it's, it's um, him, no, it's, it's moving out. Yeah, it's moving out and it's revealing um, Dylan meeting her, her dad. And it's right. this 
beautiful scene full of warmth and he's he's doing it he's charming the dad it's mm -hmm. it's great and then you're and then you're um pushing back in and it's a completely different day i wanted to match that exactly so there were some structured things mm -hmm. but then there were also moments where it's free flowing and i wanted to have the sort of collage kaleidoscope of of memories at the end mm -hmm. i wanted that to be the kind of thing that we'd find in the edit right and okay. so we did that but i mean there were just we were like you know, drinking wine and crying a lot. <laughs> Just, you know, very serious stuff. <laughs> That's where the art comes from, right? Yeah, yeah. obviously. Um, we are actually now truly out of time, yeah. so I'm sorry we can't have any more <laughs> questions, not even from me, but I just want to ask you to join me in thanking this remarkable artist, yeah. Taylor Swift. Thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cameron. Aww. Thank you. Aww. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you for coming.